And uh, Jeannie Culver texted me this week. It's one of her uh, favorite, most challenging uh, set of verses. So she's uh, pleased about that. And we were <clears throat> working on a sense of being. There's so much doing, but uh, how do you create a sense of being uh, in the midst of so many calls for action? And so we're trying to think, you know, here we're going back to school. Who do we need to be uh, at the same time uh, as there's so many things that we have to do? And does what we do come out of who we are called to be? <clears throat> so I, I put up a little uh, outline of Romans. Uh, I grabbed a couple off the Internet. I love this one. This one's uh, just great. Uh, this one is about righteousness. I had I a clicker. There we go. Uh, this one, there's an introduction in the first, and that always happens. There's a greeting that happens in the beginning of Paul's letters, and then he gets right into who God is. It's all about the righteousness of God, and then it's the gift of righteousness to us. What is righteousness like? What is righteousness like in God's treatment of Israel? And then finally, we get into chapter 12, which is about righteousness in relationships and then there's a conclusion and a farewell, which is sort of the typical, the introduction and the conclusion are typical of almost all of Paul's letters. So I, I like that one because it's like just moving through righteousness. So John Barry put that together. And then there's another one, one that is um, introduction and then it's the problem. Uh, Paul addresses what the problem is, the problem that we're all struggling with. And it's the problem of sin. And uh, because we all sin, we are all justly condemned. And because that's the problem, there needs to be a remedy for that. There needs to be a solution for that. There needs to be a fix. And the fix is the, is the good news. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the possibility of redemption through Jesus Christ. And uh, how do you then develop that new life in Christ? And it's also a lot about how this relates to the Jews, how this relates to the people of Israel that Paul was so much a part of. And that's 9 to 11. And then we get to where we are for the next four weeks, practical application of the law of Christ. How does this apply to our lives? How can we live this out as faithful Christians? And then Christ administered to both Jew and Gentile. There's that theme all, almost all the way through Romans, Jew and Gentile. How is this good news for both Jew and Gentile? And then the, the, the ending with personal greetings, final exhortations, and a doxology. So we're going to be thinking about the practical application of these words. And because of that, I've moved into the message. If you want to go read them, it's uh, we'll be reading both this morning, but I read it from the new RSV, and that gives you kind of one feel. And then a fellow named Eugene Peterson, a noted New Testament scholar, he wanted people to read the Bible and to be able to more fully understand it. And he put together this, it's not a, it's, it's not a translation, it's a paraphrase called the message, but it really puts it in language, I think, that is so much easier to understand. So with that practical application, I wanted to call out today the importance of Romans to John Wesley and Methodism. Before I go into this, uh, who already knows what it, why Romans is so important to John Wesley and Methodism? Andy, you can't answer. Robert Stovall, you were with me in England, you know. I think I should know this. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was very important to John Wesley and Methodism, and I'm going to walk you through that here in just a minute, because uh, it is very much the beginning of Wesley's uh, movement into his new understanding of the world. As you re probably recall, John Wesley came to Georgia to try and convert the savages, quote unquote, and he came over here in the early days of Georgia and pre air conditioning. And I really think his message was you think it's hot now, it's going to get even hotter if you don't repent, you don't return. And I could probably start using that message again these days. You think it's hot now, and we need to be doing some things to uh, help rectify that. Uh, he came here and had very little luck. And he went home a defeated man, not really understanding why people just didn't listen to him. And he couldn't convert people here uh, to the message that he was trying to share. And he was pretty much a harsh man. He, was, he had very high expectations of himself and of other people. 
And he didn't come across with a lot of kindness and grace and mercy in the way that he presented the gospel. Um, it wasn't quite turn or burn, but it certainly didn't have, it certainly had an edge to it. And one of the things, as you remember, as he was traveling across the, the uh, ocean, I, I can't think of anything worse than being in uh, a, an old boat traveling across the Atlantic before deodorant, before, <laughs> you know, I mean, it just, I get seasick on Lake Lanier. I mean, this would have been terrible for me. And he experienced the Moravians who in the midst of a storm at sea, quietly prayed and sang. And he, he wanted that for himself. He wanted that sense of peace. He wanted that sense of assurance. And uh, those of us who, uh, you know, are pretty high strung, like Wesley was, you know, for him to see that in other people, he yearned for that for himself. He wanted that just sense that that peace that passes all understanding. And because of the book of Romans, uh, he begins to get that. But he doesn't get it during the reading of the book of Romans. He gets it during the opening credits. Anybody just, you know... Uh, I have a favorite movie, but it's the opening credits that are their favorite. You know, can you tell me about the opening credits of your favorite movie? Downton Abbey. Downton Abbey, okay, you remember that? Train ride. Okay, the train ride, yeah. Okay, scene. it is a beautiful scene. It kind of gets things started. Uh, anybody else remember the opening credits of a movie they love? Top Gun. Top Gun, okay, what happens? First one. Okay, what happens in the Look credits? The aircraft carrier and the... Okay, landing on the aircraft carrier? Well, they're getting ready to take off. Okay, getting ready to take Kenny off. Loggins. Okay, Kenny Loggins, <laughs> danger zone. Okay, That's anybody right. else remember the opening credits? Saving Private Ryan. Saving Private Ryan. Yes, that that walk to Normandy is one of is is a profound moment as as they slowly watch this older man walk to walk to the graves at Normandy. It's a it's a beautiful opening. Uh, you know, a lot of time is spent on the opening credits. Uh, I've taught the movie Michael several times, and the opening of Michael is uh, <clears throat> moving in toward a windstorm that happens in Kansas, if you will. It's in Iowa, but it's a recreation of the Wizard of Oz, and they just go up and down these hills uh, out in the Midwest. So this is during the opening credits, and John Wesley has a conversion experience during the reading of the opening credits. Uh, and he talks about that in his uh, journals. Uh, so his journal for May 24th, he says this, I think it was about five this morning that I opened my testament. He woke up very early. He was a person of great method, of great discipline. I think at about five in the morning, I opened my testament, and these were the words. There are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, even that we should be partakers of the divine nature. And just as I went out, I opened it again on these words, you are not far from the kingdom of God. In the afternoon, I was asked to go to Paul's. Now, Robert, what is that? It's a bake shop in London. Oh. Remember Paul's bake shops? You know, they're really great, fine bake shops. No, Paul's is St. Paul's. St. Paul's Anglican Cathedral. So it was St. Paul's Cathedral. Uh, I went to Paul's. He just does it as, uh, you know, it's not Paul Rosemond's. It's uh, I went to Paul's. And the anthem was, out of the depth I've called to you, O Lord, Lord, hear our voice. So let your ears consider well the voice of my complaint. If you, Lord, will be extreme to mark what is done amiss, O Lord, who may abide it? For there is mercy in with you. So you can see, you know, what is going on in his mind uh, as he's dealing with his own, you know, complaints. Therefore, shall you be feared, O Lord, trust in the Lord, for with the Lord there's mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his sins. And that is what he says on Wednesday. He then says, in the evening, I went very unwillingly. Has that ever been you? I went very unwillingly somewhere. In the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street. And I always love when we go to England to like see this and it's a non-event. I mean, there's just like nothing there. 
there's a little plaque and that's about it. There's nothing to really, uh, you know, help remember this. It's not really a place anymore. So uh, there was a gathering and there are thoughts about where it might have been. And then there's this big plaque that has some of these words right here on it at the museum uh, there uh, in London, the, the Museum of London. Uh, about a quarter before nine, sorry, I went unwillingly where one was reading Luther's preference preface to the epistle of the Romans. So he's not even reading Romans. He's reading Luther's introduction to Romans. It's basically the opening credits. And during those opening credits, while someone is reading the opening credits about a quarter before nine, while I was describing, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ. And I think Wesley had always been, this had been a heady faith. This has been something in his head. This has been something that he studied, and he was very much a scholar, and this had very much been an intellectual exercise, and you kind of see this change from head to heart, and he stressed both in his theology, he stressed both in what it meant to be United Methodist, and what it meant to be Methodist, and then later United Methodist, both, both heart and mind and hands all working together. So, it described the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ. I felt my heart strangely warm. That's really the, the mark of Methodism. I felt my heart strangely warm. And that's how Wesley changes from uh, sort of, he still was, was had very high standards, but there was this harshness that melted away a bit uh, as he felt his own heart strangely more warmed, and it moved from his head to his heart. I was working with one uh, young man who was getting ready to be ordained, and in his ordination papers, he wrote, my conversion experience was much like that of Martin Luther. I had my heart strangely warmed. We had a hard time ordaining him because the very basis of Wesley's conversion is a heart strangely warm, but somehow he thought it was Luther. He also preached his uh, uh, ordination sermon about how people try to put God in little chubby holes. <laughs> and I was like, I think you mean cubby holes. And he's like, cubby holes? I always thought it was chubby holes. And I was like, no. Putting God in chubby holes is not <laughs> correct. Um, another guy, it's always interesting to read people's ordination work. And uh, one guy um, uh, did his whole ordination sermon on the ghost of Bob Marley. From, from A Christmas Carol? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I was like, it was Jacob Marley. Bob Marley is a whole different thing, <laughs> you know, you know, the whole Rost affair. I mean, maybe he had a different experience of Christ than Wesley, but uh, the ghost of Bob Marley, the ghost of, John, of, of Jacob Marley, I think those are different. But, but he felt his heart strangely warmed, and these are the most famous of the Wesley quotes. I've, let's read it together. I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ. Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. I began to pray with all my might for those who had in a more special manner despitefully used me and persecuted me. This is Wesley's change of heart. And this is where he became on fire for the gospel. And he just had to make sure that everyone was invited and loved into a relationship. Um, I don't preach from the pulpit, as you may have may have not have realized. I haven't preached from a pulpit for 20 years. I was up at camp meeting and I had to memorize five sermons for five days. 11 o'clock on Thursday, I mean, 8 o'clock Thursday night, 11 o'clock Friday morning, 8 o'clock Friday night, 11 o'clock Saturday morning, 8 o'clock Saturday night, and then three services here. And I got through the first two memorized, and then I was like, I can't do this. <laughs> and so I preached from the pulpit that morning, and it worked really well. So I preached from the, the pulpit, uh, the third one from the pulpit that morning, and it worked great. And then I tried... When I was, it was sorry, that was that evening, the first evening I preached from the pulpit. 
and it worked great the third sermon then the next morning i tried to preach from the pulpit again and it was terrible it was one of the worst things i pity the people who had to listen to me for that period of time so then the last one i went back to my usual uh without a net and part of that is a theological movement because wesley was kicked out of the churches of england he was kicked out of their pulpits, and he went to wherever people were. He did a thing called field, field preaching, and he preached on a stump. He preached in a quarry. He preached wherever the people were. He didn't say, come on in, the water's fine. If you'll just come to church, I'll get to communicate with you. He went out to where the people were, and uh, they said it was like a man who was set on fire, and people came to watch him burn. And he just had such a fire after this. And you can look at this next one. It's all about the heart, the heart, the heart, the heart. Luther's talking about this change of heart. And I think as Wesley is hearing this, he's realizing that he has made this all about his head and not about his heart. And the journal continues where he writes, I then testified openly to all there what I now first felt in my heart. heart. But it was not long before the enemy suggested, this cannot be faith, and where is your joy? Then was I caught, then was then was I taught that peace and victory over sin are essential to faith in the captain of our salvation. And I, I wanted to uh, expand your minds with the journals of Wesley a little bit this morning. I don't know how many of you studied Wesley's journals or Wesley's sermons, so I thought it would just give you a little bit. Uh, of Wesley's journal and his conversation with the Romans. And then finally he says, and here and I found the difference between this and my former state chiefly consisted. I was striving, yea, fighting with all my might under the law as well as under grace. But then I was sometimes, if not often, conquered. I will always, I was always conqueror. And then he says, the moment I awakened, Jesus' master was in my heart and my mouth. I found all my strength lay in keeping my eyes fixed on him and my soul waiting on him continually. Being at Paul's in the afternoon, I could taste the good word of God. Isn't that beautiful? I could taste the good word of God in the anthem which began, my song shall always be of the loving kindness of the Lord. And you can feel this conversion experience that's happening in his heart and his mind. My mouth will I ever be showing forth your truth from one generation to another. And uh, we can read Luther's preface to the Romans. Uh, he's got a lot to say, but these are the kind of uh, things that happen in, I mean, this is, this is what converts John Wesley. Sorry. The list letters are the most important piece in the New Testament. It's the purest gospel. It's well worth a, a Christian's while, not only to memorize it word for word, but also to occupy himself with it daily. And we're going to hopefully occupy ourselves with it daily. As you ju I just ask you to spend time with the 12th chapter this month of August. Here's the first day. And so I invite you to study it. I invite you to read it in the message. I invite you to read it and ponder it. If you can memorize some of it, that would be wonderful. Uh, but it's pretty dry. I just want you to know that Wesley's conversion happens through a pretty dry opening credits. But his heart has been has been opened he there's been plowing that has been done for him to be ready and then it, he talks about chapter 12 which is where we're going to be living in chapter 12 saint paul teaches the true liturgy and makes all of us priests we are a priesthood of all believers uh, some of us are clergy and we are set apart for a certain kind of ministry but we're all called to be in ministry of one kind or one another so that they may offer not money or cattle as priests do in the law, but their own bodies by putting their own desires to death. Next, he describes the outward conduct of Christians whose lives are governed by the Spirit. He tells them how they teach, preach, rule, serve, give, suffer, love, live, and act toward friend, foe, and everyone. These are the works that a Christian does, for as I have said, faith is not idle. Um, faith is not idle. It's probably one of the reasons Luther talked about uh, um, James, but he talked about James' faith without works is dead. He didn't like uh, James. He said it was an epistle of straw. So here we move into new, the new RSV, and you, you hear uh, a very different language than we're going to hear in just a few minutes from the message. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, on the basis of God's mercy, 
to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. I love this kind of movement in Paul's thought uh, because we have come out of a, a faith that is tied to animal sacrifice. And now he's moved this to say, no longer are we sacrificing animals, but now we're presenting our own bodies but our bodies as a living sacrifice. And that's a thought that I want you to ponder. What does it mean to be a living sacrifice? What does it mean to sacrifice, but not die, but live more fully because you have sacrificed? And then you, you remember these words. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing, renewing of your mind. So that, and whenever you see so that in Paul's writings, I, I like to circle it because the so that is like, okay, I'm getting to the point here. So that, and so always the so that is like, I'm going to drive this thing home so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and what is perfect. It's a living sacrifice. Um, it's a living sacrifice. How <clears throat> do we make a sacrifice live? What is a life-giving sacrifice? Uh, is it the process of dying to self? And I think that's what's happening to Wesley. It's the process of dying to self. Uh, offering our bodies to God to say, God, do with my body what you will, so that we are transformed and not conformed to this world. And it's done by the renewing of our minds. And, you know, one of the questions that I have later on is, when is the last time you challenged yourself to learn something totally new, something outside of your comfort zone, something outside of your area expertise? They say that's one of the ways that we keep our mind alive is to learn something. I mean, if you're a science person, learn something about art and music. If you're an art and music person, learn something about engineering. Take something that is, is not familiar to you and struggle with it and fight with it. And, uh, you know, what, whatever area you know the least about, try learning something about, reading something about that, and expanding and renewing your mind, making some sort of shift in your life. And now we shift to the message, which I think is just beautiful. And I just love that Jeannie Culver has been studying Romans 12. And when she sent me her reading of Romans 12, she read it from the message, because it's so different from the other verses, you know, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, uh, put your bodies as a living sacrifice. Peterson puts it like this. So here's what I want you to do, folks. God helping you take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering, embracing. And that word came to me yesterday. Uh, it's amazing to me how in the midst of my own struggle, I had a meeting yesterday and I was like, I'm not sure I have time for this meeting. And in that meeting, God gave me an encounter with the word embrace that will find its way into my sermon this Sunday. And I just couldn't thank God enough at the end of that meeting. And you ever, you ever get that way? You're like, I don't know, how am I going to do this? And then you do it. And it is one of the most rewarding and helpful things. And uh, I think God just has a great sense of humor about that. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit in without even thinking about it. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out like a bone marrow transplant. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. And unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. Have you ever been drugged down to the level of immaturity around you? Have you ever been the one that drug other people down to your <laughs> level of immaturity? And then finally, uh, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. And I love this story. I, I don't know if I'll tell it on Sunday, but I love the story of a group in New Orleans called Glass Half Full. Has anybody heard of it? Uh, two Tulane, uh, one who was grad, or maybe they were still students, they were lamenting one night over a bottle of wine, how their bottle of wine was going to end up in the trash because New Orleans didn't recycle glass. Can you imagine how much glass go, they go through in New Orleans? And New Orleans doesn't just recycle grass, grass, glass. 
and uh, they probably just like recycle grass, but that's all. <laughs> different, you know. But we're like, why is this going to the landfill? Where could it be used for so many other things or repurposed? So they decided to do something about it, however small, in their everyday life. It was, you know, they just looked at their everyday life and they said, in our everyday life, is there something that needs to be different? So uh, Trotman and Stites were their names, and they launched a GoFundMe to start to buy a small machine uh, that is a European machine that turns glass into sand. You know, they need sand in Louisiana. You know, I mean, isn't this an amazing thing? And so now they have started this glass recycling company, and there are even air groups that pay them to come pick up their bottles. The other thing I didn't realize is that <clears throat> a lot of the fine restaurants in New Orleans break their bottles. Why? They take up less room. Take up less room. That that's true. Thanks. What? Fakes. Fakes is correct, Brendan. They you get a you you got a really fine wine cellar at Arno's or you know uh, one of these places, and when people will take those wine bottles, refill them as fakes, and so that most most places who do fine wine smash their bottles, and so now they're creating sand that can be used to reinforce the levees and other things. In uh, in areas where they're having extreme erosion, isn't this an amazing thing that they're able to take? They just took something that was right in front of them, and they said, "There's got to be a better way." And all you do is you stick the bottle in, and it just converts it to fine powdery sand that's not abrasive or anything. And uh, they've got themselves. Uh, I think they have four or five employees. It's not a huge operation yet, but you can see the potential from someone who took their ordinary everyday life and placed it into larger hands than theirs. So friends, pay attention to your everyday life. There may be something that's right in front of you right now that like these two folks drinking a glass of wine could convert something in such a way that could make what a, diff a great difference. So my question for you this morning is what will you do with your life? What will I do with my life? Um, I can that that makes no sense. What I wrote there. What will you do with my life this school year? What will you do with your life? What will I do with my life this school year? Uh, and how how do you know that you're mature? The way that you know you you're mature is you're able to reproduce. If you can't reproduce, then you're not a mature Christian. A mature entity, whatever it is, is able to reproduce. That's what it means to be mature. It's the ability to create another generation. And so uh, like radical mentoring, the work that you're doing there, if, if you can't create the next generation, then you are immature. So that may be something for you to, to ponder. But these are the questions that I'd like you to talk about around the table. When is the last time you worked to learn something difficult, something new? How did it transform or renew your mind? Where in particular does the culture around us drag us down? When have you been dragged down to the level of someone else's immaturity? What are you sacrificing today for God? And when have you made a sacrifice that was life-giving? Any questions about Romans this morning? I have a question for you. Yes. You referenced about Wesley Jones. Yes. For us non-raised Methodists over here, for students. Have you ever done a class on, on those things? I have not, but that would be good. I mean, they're... they're um, I mean, are they worth class? Well, I mean, I, I think somebody better than me. Uh, I mean, we do have some Methodist scholars, but... Um, who are at Emory that could they could do a great job with uh, Wesley's journals. Wesley's journals and Wesley's sermons um, are things that um, you know early Methodist preachers had to learn Wesley's sermons before they could go out and preach their own. Uh, so Wesley's journals and sermons might be something uh, interesting to look at. And it's it's one of the things that is so different now is that. We know we do everything electronically. We do things on the phone. There's so much of our history that's lost because we had a conversation about it. We didn't write it down. And Wesley wrote down everything. And that's one of the, his geniuses, but it's also one of the things that uh, allow us to reach deeply into our history is his journaling and his compilation of sermons. So it might be fun to have a few week class on some of his key sermons, um, like Almost Christian and things like that as well as to take an in-depth look at his journals, because you really get an insight into, his, in, into both his struggles and his victories.
Uh, next week, uh, I've made it very difficult for David because next week I'm preaching on just one verse. So I'm preaching on verses one and two this week. I'm preaching on verse three next week. And David is like, what am I going to do for best man? You've given me one verse. And I said, well, teach about Romans. Talk about the, the, the rest of Romans. So you get, might get a more in-depth thing because all David has next week to work on is one single verse, uh, chapter three, chapter 12, verse three. So one and two this week, three next week. I think it's four and six and then seven and eight. And, and then I think for Labor Day, we do like 10, 11 and 12. So I think you guys can handle 12 verses in chapter 12. I'd love for you to immerse yourself in them. Anything else? Discuss among yourselves. Brian, I'm glad you made it. Thank you.